one of over 200 blockades across Poland meant to shield the country from Ukrainian products. Farmers here are on a collision course with the expansion of the European Union. Forget about this the crazy idea. EU membership offers economic opportunities to millions. We know exactly what we want. We want to be part of EU. More and more people in EU states are in favor of letting new countries join the club. And EU officials have been pledging to make it happen. Completing our union is the call of history. It is the natural horizon of the European Union. But the countries in line to enter are poorer than those already in the EU. And some Europeans worry that enlargement will threaten their livelihoods. We uh, most probably uh, go for the bankruptcy. In this episode, we will look at what it means for citizens to join one of the world's biggest economies. I think uh, that that would give, uh, give us like more uh, legitimacy. We will assess the cost of enlarging. We're, we're talking peanuts, frankly speaking. And we will ask, can the EU afford to grow? That's all coming up on Business Beyond. For more than a decade, the EU seemed like a closed club with a line of members waiting to get in. Turkey became an EU membership candidate in 1999. In 2018, its accession process was suspended, but that's a story for another episode. In 2005, North Macedonia joined the queue. Montenegro followed in 2010, Serbia in 2012, and Albania in 2014. For a country to join the EU, it must fulfill certain criteria, like being a democracy, respecting the rule of law and human rights, and having a functioning market economy. But for the past 20 years, reforms of candidates have been slow, and the EU's mantra was anti-enlargement. This is the former president of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. Während dieses Kommissions- und Parlamentsmandates wird es keine neuen Mitglieder geben, weil die Beitrittsbedingungen nicht erfüllt werden können. When Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, all that changed. The war catapulted EU expansion to the top of the agenda. A year later, EU officials launched accession talks with Ukraine and Moldova, granted candidate status to Georgia, and for the first time set a clear goal. I believe we must be ready on both sides by 2030 to enlarge. At the moment, a total of nine countries are candidates to joining. Admitting them will be a challenge for the bloc's budget. This illustrates why. Luxembourg is the EU's richest country by GDP per capita, and Bulgaria the poorest. Every single country actively on the list to joining the EU has a lower GDP per capita than Bulgaria. But what's the economic impact of admitting these countries? Well, that depends on who you ask. Nathalie Tocci is a former advisor on European foreign policy. I would say, you know, in most cases, because of course there was the one exception where there was a very clear economic upside, which was the northern enlargement. But if you take all other cases, the southern enlargement of the 1980s, uh, the eastern enlargement of the 1990s, and then of course, uh, and 2000s, and then of course, uh, this question mark enlargement, it is clear that that economics upside is, is not there. The head of the European Commission sees things differently. The expansion of our single market brings economy of scale for our businesses, increases our competitiveness and therefore the strength of our single market. Our history of enlargement has dented economic success story. Before we dive deeper into whether the EU can afford to grow, let's take a quick look at what the EU even is. It was born out of the rubble of post-war Europe. The so-called European Economic Community was meant to bring peace through economic cooperation. What started with just a few countries ballooned into the European Union with a total of 27 member states. How it functions exactly is ridiculously complicated. But for the sake of this explainer, it's only important to know some basics. Firstly, the EU is a single market. The aim of the single market is to make trade between EU countries as simple as possible. It essentially means people, goods, money and services can move freely between EU countries. 
And as a bonus, most EU members also use the euro, which makes transactions even easier. Another important detail, EU countries pay membership dues. The amount each country pays depends on its wealth. At the same time, member states also get money from the EU. It spends the biggest chunks of its budget on regional development and agriculture. Those member states that are less well off relative to the others get more money from the EU than they pay in. Because of how the EU's budget works, many worry about one country joining in particular. Now, Ukraine is obviously a different ballgame because of its size, uh, because of its agriculture sector, because of its, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, average uh, wealth, which is obviously lower than that of uh, the EU, and above all, because it's a country at war with, you know, 500 billion in reconstruction and still counting, right? Ukraine would become the EU's biggest agricultural producer and one of its most populous countries. At the same time, it would be the poorest. That would mean a drastic reshuffle of the EU's finances. And a big change for one country in particular, Poland. EU funds are mainly allocated through relative wealth, so admitting Ukraine into the EU could turn Poland from the biggest recipient of funds into a net payer. Poland's government here in Warsaw has been one of the staunchest supporters of Ukraine since the outbreak of the war. And broadly speaking, support for Ukraine joining the EU is among the highest here in Poland. But when it comes to the more sensitive economic sectors, the picture looks different. For the past months, Poland's farmers have been in revolt. How would you feel about Ukraine entering the European Union? No way, never. Forget it. Uh, they supposed to forget about this uh, crazy uh, idea, I think. As a show of solidarity with Ukraine following Russia's invasion, the EU agreed to allow goods from Ukraine to come into the bloc with little to no restrictions. Farmers in the border regions saw their produce prices plummet. They fear it's just a first taste of what's to come. The EU has been pushing to open up its borders to Ukraine Polish farmers are blocking the roads leading to the country. They worry that EU expansion will threaten their livelihood. In 2004, Poland's farmers joined the ranks of the biggest food producers in the EU. If Ukraine enters the Union, that role is under threat, because Ukraine's industrial farms dwarf European ones. Lukas Czech is a grain and pig farmer. I asked him what would happen if Ukraine were to join the EU anytime soon. We uh, most probably uh, go for the bankruptcy, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, because it w we would be easily flooded uh, of the much cheaper uh, products from uh, the Ukraine. With the help of EU innovation funds, Lucas invests in new technology for his produce. In the European Union, we have incredibly high standards of food production. We have a lot of documentation, checking, probing, veterinary science. Uh, services, we have IT system to measure every movement of every pig or every poultry. If Ukraine were to join the European Union, it would likely get the biggest chunk of its agriculture budget. At the same time, farms like this one in Poland would lose out on subsidies. But it's not just subsidies Lukas worries about. He thinks opening the EU's borders to Ukraine before it meets European food production standards is foul play. Like we have the football match and uh, you have uh, like one team is not getting the red cards or yellow cards yes for for uh, for uh, what they doing because of the war yes and uh, and it's huge deal which should be managed by governance and government uh, of european union back in warsaw Paweł Szliwowski of the polish economic institute is more optimistic for example, uh, Polish uh, farmers could try to produce more complex uh, products. So they can try to move up on the ladder of value chain production and then uh, should try to seek opportunities, uh, for example, in buying some uh, raw basic commodities from Ukraine, uh, work on them here and sell them with uh, some of the margin of um, gain. We've taken a detailed look at the economics of Ukraine joining. But what about the other candidates? The Western Balkans. Most countries in this region have been EU candidates for over a decade, North Macedonia even for two. 
creeping reforms in the region, bilateral disputes between EU countries and candidates, and slow reactions from Brussels have stalled the enlargement process. But here, the economic story is a different one. The cost of admitting the Western Balkans would be significantly smaller. If you take, basically, uh, the six Western Balkan countries, um, Georgia and Moldova, add them all up together, we, demographically speaking, we're talking about more or less the same size of the United Kingdom. We're talking peanuts, frankly speaking. Peanuts for the EU, but let's look at what it means for Canada countries to join one of the world's biggest economies. Montenegro is the country furthest ahead in the queue to joining the EU. And at this market in Podgorica, it kind of seems like it's already a member. Since 2002, Montenegrins have been paying with euros. For the country with a population of 630,000, Europe's currency offers a guarantee of stability. But EU membership doesn't only promise abstract macroeconomic benefits, it would also be felt concretely. Jasna Pevic founded an online learning startup in Montenegro's capital. For her, being an EU citizen would be transformative. I think uh, that that would give, uh, give us like more le uh, legitimacy on the one side and on the other side like uh, better brand perceptions. Being part of the EU would be a stamp of approval for international investors. And another thing is like, oh, we never did business with, uh, with uh, Montenegro. We don't know how to do this, what are payment options, what are law regulations. And for them, uh, I asked them, but if we are part of European Union, would it be different? And for many of them, they said that would be different because they know about European Union. Jasna is by far not the only Montenegrin who has high hopes for EU membership. 80% of the population wants to be part of the Union. Citizens in the Western Balkans earn on average just 14% of their European neighbors. At this moment we are around 45 to 48% of living standard compared to EU countries. And that's the big dream in accession process. Converging in real terms with living standards. Mila Kasalitsa has been following Montenegro's progress towards EU membership closely. She says the biggest cost of accession won't lie with the EU. It's not a question of a cost. Costs are mainly uh, part of local communities because it's not uh, uh, Brussels' question how we will converge to them or how we will fulfill the rules. It's our job. It's our accountability, it's our responsibility. The road to EU membership has been long for Montenegro, with much still to be gained. Higher living standards, a bigger customer market and more international appeal. Many people in Montenegro hoped that EU membership would bring about an economic boost. Montenegro's government aims to join the bloc by 2028. Experts warn that goal is unrealistic. So far, the EU has only approved a fraction of Montenegro's reforms. Sometimes EU leaders don't know exactly what they want. We know exactly what they want. We want to be part of EU. This is as soon as possible. A look at Montenegro unveils a paradox. Economically, the Western Balkans could be embraced by the single market and lift the living standards of millions. Admitting the countries is much cheaper than admitting Ukraine. But the region's accession process has dragged on, while Ukraine's has momentum behind it. That's because the question of whether the EU can afford to expand is about much more than just money. Особисто для мене я б хотіла, щоб мої діти жили, щоб Україна була з Євросоюзом однозначно, і діти діти не знали, що таке війна. Якщо ми не будемо з Євросоюзом, ну на мою особисту думку, що війна війна може повторитися і ще не раз. Being part of the EU comes with a mutual defense guarantee, so attacking a member state is more costly. It's part of the rationale driving Ukraine's push towards Europe. Tuna Guyen researches EU enlargement. For obvious reasons, um, the EU is now seeing enlargement as a security um, instrument. So the EU wants to enlarge for security reasons, and the budget is part of the discussions, um, but it might not necessarily be the, the deciding factor in it. 
With an armed conflict raging on its borders, perhaps the better question is no longer whether the EU can afford to expand, but whether it can afford not to. So there are going to be economic costs, but the argument is that those economic costs are worth undertaking, uh, given that the strategic upside uh, of doing it, or rather the strategic downside of not doing it, <laughs> is, is far too great. Vladimir Putin's land grab has pushed EU leaders to reevaluate the importance of expansion. So in a sense, enlargement was revived because of a security logic which is tied to Eastern Europe. And the challenge for those that believe in enlargement more broadly, and therefore also the Balkans, um, I mean, the question is, how do we tag on to that momentum? What also remains to be seen is whether the war in Ukraine creates enough momentum for EU members to put their money where their mouth is. Where does that extra money come from? Um, actually, that is also an open question. Um, it is possible that it comes from the current member states. Um, it is also possible that the EU raises its own money through new own resources. There are discussions at the moment, for example, through a plastic tax or through the new um, carbon adjust adjustment mechanisms. The question of whether the EU can afford to expand or not is a matter of perspective. And many of the costs can only be estimated for now. But a look at the past enlargement rounds can offer some lessons on the benefits of letting new countries join. In Poland, initial costs for the EU translated into an economic boom for the country. And that boom helps member states too. When Poland joined the European Union and the European Common Market a few years ago, uh, we started a very um, dynamic and profound uh, transformation of the Polish uh, economy. I think what, what we, we can acknowledge is that, of course, these are poorer countries that will enter the EU. At the same time, it comes with benefit for the internal market, which becomes um, bigger. It comes with benefit because the workforce becomes larger. And there is another lesson to be learned from the past. Any budget reshuffle to new members doesn't happen overnight. During the last enlargement round, new member states only received a fraction of their agriculture funding initially. Then the funding was increased in phases. The EU actually has adaptation mechanisms to ensure that the fluctuations of what member states receive and pay in is not too high and the EU also has adaptation mechanisms to deal with enlargement to ensure that also there the, the, the extra costs are not immediately very, very big. At the beginning of this episode, we asked whether the EU can afford to expand. What's clear is that an enlargement wave would mean a drastic economic reshuffle. For some in Europe's society, that change would be felt concretely. Do I end up losing part of the budget? Well, mostly, yes, you do. In my view, this is an unavoidable scenario. And uh, to be more strict, this is a positive scenario. Because uh, when you are a net payer, it means you are a rich, developed and a country with a strong economy. At the same time, letting in new countries brings economic opportunities to millions of people. And that's the big dream in accession process. Converging in real terms with living standards. The experts we spoke to emphasize that when it comes to enlargement, affordability is also a question of political will. So there are going to be economic costs, but the argument is that those economic costs are worth undertaking, uh, given that the strategic upside uh, of doing it, or rather the strategic downside of not doing it, <laughs> is, is far too great. The question that remains, is there enough momentum in Europe's enlargement plans to move member states to front the bill? That's all for this episode. And now we would love to know what you think of Business Beyond. If you have the time, please fill in the survey on the on-screen link or in the description. Thanks for watching and take care.